learners, welcome to Education Online program of Teacher Willa Lucia. So in our previous uh, lessons, we've been talking a lot about the abortion, uh, how we can express motion in graphical form, and so many other things. We also looked at pose. So today we're going to look at pose and motion. So we have it as our pose. And motion. We want to know what a force is and even the motion and what is the relationship between the two. So you'll find out that when you're talking about a force, you're talking about the pull or a push that changes a body's state of rest or the uniform motion. So what about the motion? You'll see that a motion is just the continuous change of a body's position. If the body keeps on moving from one point to another and again to another, that we say that the body is in motion. So if you look at this, there is a relationship even between the force and the motion. Before we go to the, to the relationship, let's first get to know what are the effects of a force on a body. What happens when you apply a force on any other object? You'll see that uh, when your object is moving, uh, effects, effects of force. When your body was already moving, you had given it an initial velocity. What happens then? You'll see that when you apply force to this body that is already moving, it can cause that, uh, that body to either reduce its velocity or it can increase the velocity of that body or it will make the body to come back to, to rest. Now there you see that we already have three effects. That means that it can decrease. It can decrease. The motion of a body, uh, it can increase the motion. It can also bring a body to a body to rest. That is if the body is moving. What if the body is just at rest? What happens? Like uh, right now, I'm just standing still. If I apply a force on me, what happens? You see that if you applied it on this side, I can, it can push me like this. Or if it is really, if the uh, the force is large, you see that I'm displaced a bit instead of remaining in this same position. That means that it can cause an object to start moving. So we have another effect here. Can cause. An object to move. What if you have this and then I press it? I'm trying to press it like this. What happens? You see that the, the shape of this has totally changed. Why? Because I tried apply, applying some force on it. So that means that when you apply force on something, it can also deform or change the shape of that object. That is another effect of force. It can deform, deform an, can deform an object. So you see that a force has so many effects on, on an object. So you see that even when the object is in motion, it can change the direction of the, of, the, of the body. For example, if I'm running, and then you try to give me a little push, what happens is that instead of me continuing in this straight line that I was taking, I divert. That means that the force has caused me to change the direction that I was initially taking. So what are these relationship between the force and the motion? This relationship here was first started by, uh, it was started by a scientist called Galileo Galilei. 
So he wanted to find out the relationship between the two, but then he left his work unfinished. So then here comes another scientist known as the, uh, Sir Isaac Newton. So Sir Isaac Newton carried so many uh, experiments to find the relationship between the mass, the force, and the motion. So when he carried out all this experiment, he tried summing them up. So when he summed them, after summing them, he summarized them into three laws. And those laws are now known as the Newton's laws of motion. Why are they called the Newton's laws of motion? This is because it was Newton that discovered. So we are just borrowing Newton's name. And you find out force also is measured in uh, force. We are saying the SI unit is Newton. Why? Because it was him that discovered this theory here. So if we say he summarized them into three laws, what are these laws? So we say they are called the Newton's. Newton's laws of motion. And we are saying they are, they are basically three. So we're going to start from the first law, which states that, uh, let me have it here as our first law, first Newton's, Newton's law of motion. What does it state? So when you look at this Newton's law of motion, it's saying that a body continues in its uh, state of rest or uniform motion in a straight line unless it is acted upon by an external force. Meaning that if the body is at rest, it keeps its position. It doesn't want to move from that position. So when it was already given a motion, what happens is that it wants to continue with the motion instead of coming to, to rest. So if we say that, this one states that a body continues in its state of rest. A uniform motion in a straight straight line unless acted upon by an external external force. Some people will call it uh, external force, and sometimes they say it is the unbalanced force. Because when the force is balanced, you see that the body keeps its position. If it is at rest, it continues at that state. But then if it is already moving, it keeps on moving. Let's look at this. Imagine we're having here balanced force. If we have balanced force and we are saying that this one here is at rest, the body is at rest, it means it doesn't have any other acceleration acting on it. it, it there is no ac acceleration the body is, is moving with. So meaning that here A is equals to is zero. What if the body under this balanced force is already in, in motion? That means it has an acceleration it is actually accelerating so if anybody is accelerating what happens the acceleration there is not equals to zero but it has a certain value so this one is not equivalent to to zero so what if you continue to apply this balanced force on the body if you continue applying a balanced force on any object that is at rest. It will continue with its state here. Still remains at the same position. And still here, it will move with an 
with an acceleration which is not equivalent to, to zero. This is why you find out that in the car, when you start, when you want to start uh, moving the car, what happens is that the passengers who are seated in the car will either move forward or backwards depending if you're starting either starting the car or you're bringing it back to to rest why is that motion this is because there is already unbalanced force that is trying to act on this body and the body is trying to resist that force it wants to remain where it is it, the passenger is trying to remain on the chair without moving forward or backwards but then that force keeps it that unbalanced force, when it becomes higher, you see that the body moves and then comes back. This is why you find that in our cars, we have the provision of seat belts. So not only the cars, let's take a look at the athletes. What happens is that when they are running, they're already in motion. When they reach the finish line, what happens? Do they just reach the, finish, the finishing line and stop there? No. They do not just stop there, but you see someone reaching the finishing line, crosses it, and continues. Then the person moves some, uh, some distance and then stops. This is because of the body's reluctance to, to stop. Actually, the body no longer wants to stop. It just wants to continue running. So that is under the first, uh, first law of motion, Newton's law of, of motion. So you see that there are so many examples you can find on that. So many common observations under that. So you'll find out that this first law here is sometimes known as the, the moment of uh, the inertia. So when you're talking about this inertia, you see that it is the reluctance of, this, uh, of a body to come to rest when it's already in motion or to continue when it is when it to go to start motion when it is at rest and then people try to confuse uh, uh inertia with impulse so these two are actually not the same when we are talking about impulse it's just the product of force and time so if you're multiplying your force times time you're not getting that the inertia there but instead you're getting the, the impulse. So th those two are actually not the same. So we also have the second equation, uh, the second Newton's law of motion. What does this second, second law state? So let's have it here. You'll find out that with the second Newton's law of motion. Let's take a look at this example. You're having your wheelbarrow, and you want to uh, the, you want to move the wheelbarrow. You're pushing it to reach some other point. What happens is that this is your this is you right here you're here uh, these are your arms uh, then probably the wheelbarrow is somewhere here uh, assuming this is our wheelbarrow then this is your you're trying to push this wheelbarrow okay the handle of our wheelbarrow is up to here so you're holding it here. You're moving this wheelbarrow to that side. Where are you? Where is the wheelbarrow accelerating? You see that it is moving to this to this side. And then this wheelbarrow here has got its own weight. Even though you just take the weight of this or you've added sand, that means still there is 
Wait here. This one has a mask. What of you? What are you doing? Where are you applying the force? You see that you're moving this way also, taking that direction. So as you're pushing this wheelbarrow, you're using some energy. There is a force you're applying for the wheelbarrow to, to move to another point. So as you're pushing it, it moves in that direction where the force, are. you see that your force here is following the, the acceleration there. Meaning that if you want to state this Newton's law of motion, you see that the force is the force and the, and the acceleration are actually taking the same side. So we can say that the the second uh, Newton's law of motion states that the rate of change of momentum is directly proportional to the force applied, and it takes the direction of the of the force. That means that that momentum, when you talk about the momentum, is the product of the, of the mass and the velocity. Because you see that you're trying to push this wheelbarrow, and this wheelbarrow has a mass, and then on top of it, it is moving with a, with a velocity. There is a speed that it is taking. So this speed here also depends on the amount of force you've applied. You see that when you apply, uh, when the forces are small, the acceleration produced is also small. But then when you try to increase the force with which you're pushing this, there will be increase in acceleration. And then there can be increase in the, in the speed. So you see that when you're trying to throw something, you take it, throw it slowly, it will take a small distance, and then you see that it doesn't move very uh, very fast. But then give it a very hard throw. That means there you've increased the force. And then because all of them are moving in the same direction, that's why we are saying that the rate of change of this momentum is directly proportional to the, to the force you applied. And then takes the direction of the of the force. So we can have it here. Uh, it states that the rate of change of momentum is directly proportional proportional to the force applied and takes place in the direction direction of the force. So you will see that when the force is applied in the western direction, uh, the momentum at that point will also take the western direction. So it just depends on which direction you've actually taken. So, and then we are saying that momentum is the what? The product of force, the product of mass. So we have our momentum. Uh, as the product product of mass and velocity so if we, if it is the mass we are talking about the the amount of matter that body contains so if you multiply the mass and then the velocity with which you're pushing the uh, you're, you're pushing the the object, what you're going to get there is what is known as the momentum. So in, uh, we can make it, we can abbreviate it as m plus m, which is equal to the mass uh, times the, the velocity there. So what is the SI unit of momentum? We can find the SI unit of momentum from, uh, from its formula here. So if you know the, val uh, the SI unit of mass, I mean the standard unit. 
And then you know for the velocity, you multiply the two, because here we have multiplied the two terms, then you can get the, the SI unit of momentum. So that means that we have here our SI unit is equals to the mass. Mass is measured in, in kilogram times acceleration uh, times velocity, which is measured in it is mass per uh, meters per second. Meters per second. That means that our SI unit of momentum is equals to kilogram meters per per second. So every time you calculate a uh, momentum and you forget the SI unit, you can derive it from here, from its own formula. As long as you know the, the SI unit of the, uh, of the two measurements that have been multiplied. So if we know that, and then we are saying that uh, from our statement, we are saying our force is directly proportional to uh, to the momentum. That means that if we have our force here, uh, we have our force, which is equal to the momentum we are saying there, momentum is, v, uh, is m, mv, which is mass under velocity, but we are talking about the rate of change. That means there is initial momentum, and then there is the final momentum. When we talk about the, uh, uh, when we talk about the difference there, we have to uh, subtract the initial momentum from the, from the final momentum so that you get the, the exact uh, momentum you're trying to find. So we shall have it here as our force will be equals to final momentum times minus the initial momentum. Initial moment momentum. Even though we said it is directly proportional, but then there is another factor here, rate. Because we have the rate in our statement there, that means that there is time factor. For the body to change from the initial uh, momentum to final momentum there, that means it took it some it took some time for that for the change to occur. That means we have to include the time in our in a, in our formula here. So we are saying that if this one is directly proportional to this, meaning that this the force is inversely proportional to that to the time taken. So the more time you take, that means that you've applied less force. And then uh, the lesser time you take, that means you've applied what? Much force there. So we shall have here over there the time, time taken. So we are going to have our force now. We know the formula. The, uh, the, we know how we are supposed to write the formula of momentum, which is the, uh, the mass times the velocity. But the velocity now depends. The velocity V is always given to, uh, to final velocity attained by a body. But then there is also U that is given to a body. So that U there indicates the initial velocity, the velocity that the body starts the, the journey with or the motion with. So we are going to multiply uh, our V to mass to get the final momentum, and then we shall get the U, multiply it with the mass to get the initial momentum. So we shall have here as our MV minus MU, which is initial velocity over the, the time taken. Let us try. Now, from there, we try to factorize the, fo the common term. So if we check that, we see that uh, both the final and the initial momentum have got the, the mass. But then the mass, we are talking about the same object here. 
That means that this M, they're actually the same. So we are going to factorize it out to give us M into bracket. We have V minus U, then all of this over, over T. So if we have that, look at this expression there, the expression V minus U over T. This expression here gives us another another different thing. What is that? Look at the definition of acceleration. If we talk about acceleration, we are saying that it is the rate of change of what? Of velocity with time. If you see this, there is a change in the velocity of the body. And then there is time taken for the velocity to actually to change. That means that the whole of this is equivalent to the acceleration at which the body was was moving so we can have it there instead of having this since we know this is the rate of change of velocity with time and it is acceleration we are going to substitute our acceleration right here so we shall have it as our f is equals to m okay this one is proportional proportionality sign we have it there and so our F is directly proportional to the mass of the body and the acceleration that the body was moving with. So what if now we have this? How do you eliminate the proportionality sign? We can eliminate that by introducing a constant. So this time we are going to introduce our constant here, K, uh, which is known as the constant of uh, proportionality which will be equals to k m a but we do not want this k what will happen so if we don't want this uh, this k we are going to consider a force of one newton acting on a mass of one kilogram and accelerating at a rate of one meters per second squared so if we consider that that means that our f uh, meaning that our f because we are considering the force of one newton and then we have the mass which is equal to one kilogram and then the body is accelerating at the rate of uh, one meters per second squared if all is one and we try to substitute there to find a value of k what will happen is we, we have 1 is equals to a k times 1 times 1. So we shall have 1 is equals to 1k. So we can eliminate this 1. You can either divide it by 1, which will still give you 1. But then if you know that if it is just 1, we can leave the coefficient out. So we shall have it as 1 is equals to 2k. That means if your 1, if your k is equals to 1, Let's substitute it back there. You'll see we shall have our F is equals to 1 times M and then times A. So we shall have our force there, which is equals to mass, and then the acceleration that the body has is moving with. So this is how we come up with this formula. Everyone, you see that people, we, we keep on multiplying, uh, we keep on finding the force using this formula. But we don't know where it's coming from. It's actually coming from the, the second uh, Newton's law of, of motion. And then we see that this force here is measured in what? It is measured in Newtons. If it is measured in Newtons, how can you define Newtons? So you, if you want to define Newtons, you'll find out that it is a force. Uh, it is a force acting on a one or one kilogram, one kilogram mass that produces an acceleration of one meters per second squared. So you'll see there, from this, you can get the definition of your Newtons here. Because this force is already acting on a body, on, on a body of mass, one kilogram. And then the acceleration that body is producing is one meters uh, per second squared. So, 
this is all about our uh, first uh, Newton's law and then the second Newton's law of motion. We shouldn't be confusing the two because with the first one, we are talking about the body, uh, the reluctancy of the body to start moving or to come to rest when it is already moving. But then if you come to the second one, it is talking about the change in the, in the momentum of this body. So those are the, uh, this is how the two differ from each other. So we have come to the end of our lesson. We shall talk about the third equation of motion in our uh, next lesson. Thank you very much for attending. <laughs>